is lecture 15, um, and we have today's uh, two-hour block. We'll be talking about social networks, their analysis, and, and so on. So it comes in networks one and networks two. This first one is about predicting social ties. Now, you know what a social tie is. It's these relationships that exist between people. And what we're going to find in today's first hour is some interesting predictions about how people have done this kind of work and what we've done with it, what they can do with it is an interesting thing. But here's the Gestalt. I want to so back up just a second. That's what we're going to do today. But what we've done so far is to talk about what social computing is, how people work together in groups, how they interact socially, and so on. And we've really been thinking about what social computing, how people act, I just said that. And we came up with this idea that computer networks and social networks can be really, in fact, be social places. Remember the work of Wellman? This is like several weeks ago now. We came up with this idea of social capital as generated through social networks. We talked about bridging capital and so on. Remember that? I'm bringing this all in mind because we'll be talking about some of these ideas today. We also have the notion, the set of ideas around how do we design these things? How do we design social networks? How do we understand what they do and how people use them? So remember we had the discussion about what it means to have translucence in a network. Whenever you design something like that, you are in sort of inevitably designing metaphors and the ways people think about this. We also had that nice session on why distance matters. And so even though we think of social networks in computing as being inevitably distributed across the world, we found that distance actually makes an effect. So what this tells me is that the class is as much psychology as it is technology. Part of that psychology is the psychology of constructing identities and being deceitful in identities. We talked a little bit about how people do experiments in this space with experimental manipulations and things like the social contagion effects that we saw in the Facebook study. And this is now where we're at sort of right now. We're trying to get into the analysis methods with looking at trends and social data and so on. We talked a little bit about some of the rhythms and the effects of tie strength. And that brings us up to today. Okay, so last time we talked about ties and tie strengths that exist between people in a social network. Now we have three papers in this first hour block. The first one is by Eric Gilbert. Um, uh, no, not Eric Gilbert. The other, the other Gilbert. Who was that? What's his first name? Um, yeah, Eric Gilbert and Kari Kari Holly Holly Kari Kari Holly Hollyos. Um, and then we basically, the second paper here is we have this, another paper by Eric Gilbert on the same thing. He basically took the result of this first paper and tried to apply it to Twitter. Now the framing question for this paper that we're going to talk about right now is, can you predict anything about that social network, like the strength of ties between people based on their behaviors, based on what you see? Now, remember Grand Vettervin? A couple of weeks ago, in Grand Vetterman's paper from the from the '60s, he talked about the strength of weak ties. That is, how important even weak ties could be, because remember your supposition, your intuition might say that only strong ties matter. But Grand Vetterman showed that even weak ties matter. So the tie strength makes a big difference, and so the point of Eric Gilbert and Kari Karihalio's paper is that we would like to have a predictive model of social tie strength based on that individual's behavior in social media. How many people are they connected to? How often do they talk to them? All that sort of stuff. If we know that data, can we say, yes, you have a 90% strong relationship with this person or what? That's the question. Okay. So what we wanna do, and what they did for their study is they basically ran a Facebook survey. And this is what they did. They recruited 35 people and they went through a sort of extensive interview 
in person with each one of their participants, and they had them fill out this set of questions. They then looked at their friend relationships. They looked at the number of postings on their wall. They collected all of this data for 35 people. And this is an interesting survey because it asks questions like, uh, for everyone, for a set of your friends, how strong is your relationship with this person between whoever the participant is and, um, uh, and John, John Doe and whoever the, the friend they're talking about is? How would you feel about lending this friend $100? Now, that's a significant amount of money. But what they don't actually care about the answer, but the answer indicates the degree to which this person has a strong social tie. Remember, this is the uh, kind of expression of social capital. And in particular, that third question there, how helpful would this person be if you were looking for a job? That's straight out of Grand Vetterbin, right? That's exactly on the employment question. So you see what's happening is we're developing this sort of theory about what it means to be socially connected and a, a kind of uh, analytic framework that allows us to find the answers to those questions by asking non-obvious questions like, will you loan me a hundred bucks? Could you help me find the job? That sort of thing. So they, had, they collected all this data from 35 different people. And then what they did is they basically said, well, what, how can we think about these ties? Now, if you know, <laughs> that's a horrible typo. <laughs> that's not Grauwe Vetter, that's Grauwe Vetterven, what we talked about before. <laughs> The dimensions of tie strength, that is how closely you are connected to someone, can be described in sort of four dimensions. That was his original paper that we looked at a few weeks ago. The amount of time spent together, or the amount of time you know, in close connection, the degree of intimacy with that person, the intensity of that relationship with that person, and reciprocal services, like social capital. And they've got definitions for each of these. But basically, in the Facebook case, the amount of time spent together is the number of communications you're going to have going back and forth. So that's kind of a, a, a duration variable. You know, how much time is invested in this person? Intimacy is not, you know, it's not quite as woo-woo as you might think. It's actually just a reflection of how well your lives are interpenetrated. Do I know a lot about your family? Do I know, is the relationship between these two people very close in the sense of knowledge? And intensity is more about how you know, deeply interlocked you are with respect to your emotional affect, okay? Now, the interesting thing to think about here is those, those are the four dimensions that Greno van Vinter um, proposed, but Maybe in the age of new social networks, we can think about structural aspects. So do, for, do we, for example, have a way to look at relationships that are structured in some interesting way? So in this diagram here, you see the little node, the little yellow node on the bottom? Is that poor person socially isolated? Is the strength of that connection to the peer group in the rest of Facebook only through one bare thread? If so, what do we know about that person? So this paper basically suggests there might be other factors, including structural relationships that can be mined from the Facebook graph, the level and degree of emotional support you give to someone, and social distance. So here's what they did. They went off and collected all that data, and then they built this model. And so what they're doing is basically building a linear combination of predictive variables, all these different variables, using a fairly standard uh, regression model. Okay, So you can go look up the math for that. It's just in the paper. It's fine. But here's we've got a couple slides here on the results of this. So what's interesting here is that these are each of the, uh, these are uh, about half of the total of 70 variables they used in their model. This is, these are the 30 interesting ones. So from the 35 people, they pulled out 2,184 friendship relationships. Now, that's friend in the Facebook sense, so you don't know exactly if they're really friends or they're just somebody they're connected to. Notice that the distributions here are almost always heavily skewed. These are not normally distributed, right? So, for example, in the first variable, the reciprocal services variable at the very top, 
you see that you can see there's a, a bunch of people who have very uh, high number of uh, links exchanged. And then you have lots and lots of people out here who have no links exchanged. So the distributions are really whack. They're very power law like. Okay. We see the same thing here with social difference, uh, social distance variables down at the bottom with things like age difference. You get that's a little bit more normal. But then you get this um, funny scales like educational difference, which is compressed just into four buckets there because it's difference between a bachelor's and say a PhD or whatever. So they've got these variables, they can measure predictive intensity, they're trying to measure the, the intimacy variables. And so the intimacy here is how many friends do you share? How many friends of friends do you know? Uh, how many wall intimacy words, you see that in the middle here? Wall intimacy words and inbox intimacy words. That is, they looked at the kinds of words these people use in messages to each other or in appearances together in a photo. Again, this is just trying to figure out how closely connected these people are. Now, remember the, that ver Facebook variable, a Facebook survey at the very beginning? Here's what they did with that. So these are those five questions. How strong is your relationship? How comfortable are you? How helpful for looking for a job and so on? Look at the dis distributions here, okay? They're sort of interesting. The first one is how strong is your relationship? It's a zero to one scale and you see this sort of strangely almost flat, but not quite. It's a little bit skewed towards the, uh, the left, but you know overall it's kind of flat, especially when compared to the next one, how comfortable are you asking for a loan? Look at that. The median is 0.07. What? This means almost nobody would be asking for a loan. That is the $100 thing. That's an interesting, interesting observation because it suggests that while there are a few people you see out here, these there are some people, onesies and twosies, of people who'd be willing to ask their Facebook friend for 100 bucks. Most would not. That's a powerful measure of intimacy. <clears throat> and of course, you have uh, how upset would you be if unfriended? That's a little bit different. Again, it's not always skewed to the right. There's a huge number of hero people on the left. And how is it important to, to be bringing a friend to some event? And, you know, it's, again, sort of distributed like that. So these three bottom ones are sort of in the middle. But this one about loan is really interesting. So... They now took all this stuff and basically ran it through their model. And they found that the, the, if you look at the R square values for these five dependent variables, you can look at it in terms of this thing. Here's the top two are the only ones that really, really matter. The model performs really well on this loan of $100 and how strong is your relationship? That's no surprise because what we just looked at was that the distribution for both of those is pretty clear. The helpful for job variable is kind of in the middle. Everything else still looks pretty good. So when you take that set of numbers and sort of scatter them out in a way that to, so you can start to understand how they, they link together, you see this kind of flow chart. The tie strength, which is, you know, averaging, you know, putting all these numbers together. So a dimensional weight here is just the sum of the absolute values, right? Intimacy matters the most. Intensity matters next. Duration next. And then you start to get down and measuring things like social distance and all this jazz. It's like, ugh, doesn't matter. So those top three values are really where all the action is. What this gives you is the ability to predict. So this is the prediction part. So this paper works like this. Collect a bunch of data, build a model, and from that model, what else can we predict? And so what you find here is that these, these uh, variable days, these variables are predicted in the following way. They, so for example, they wanna be able to predict days since last communication. And these top few here are really quite good. Um, this is ordered by the beta coefficient. Cool. So you see here, this one is very, very different than the, uh, the second one. Days since last communication, days since first communication. That's a, that's a huge variable because there's a giant difference between people you've never communicated with and people you communicated with once. So that's in some sense an artificial distinction, 
but it's a big one. So it's still in the model, it's very predictive, and that's fine. Um, this third one here measures the combination of intimacy with structural relationships. That is, are you heavily connected in a closely, tightly knit network, or are you isolated and connected only by onesies and twosies? So in each case, these are sort of tend to be sort of power law things. And the bottom line here is, yes, using this analysis, this framework for getting those five sort of questions and looking at the structure of friend relationships, yes, they can predict tie strength. In particular, uh, the how strong model predicts tie strength within one-tenth of its total value. That's not bad. That's actually not bad. So that uh, if you know how strong a relationship is, you can predict a tie strength with somebody else. The intimacy dimension also makes a huge contribution for tie strength, accounting for roughly a third of it. Now, in the paper, they go on and talk about um, this other guy, uh, Marsden, who had written earlier, basically asking uh, the same question, you know, what kinds of uh, factors can we use to predict tie strength? And what he found was basically emotional closeness, which is a kind of a combination of all these other ones best reflects this tie strength. Yes, they got it. Now, pause for a second. This is an important slide because we're going to come back to it in a, in, a, in a minute when we look at the next paper, okay, which is right here. The important thing from that paper we just looked at was that was predicting tie strength in Facebook, okay? So now that was Eric Gilbert and his advisor, Kerry Carhalios at, at Illinois. So Eric then goes off to Georgia Tech and basically does the same kind of work using the same model we just saw on Twitter. Great thing to do if you've got a new PhD, right? You just wrote your, your work, you've done all this stuff. Now, can you reuse that? This is an interesting scientific thing because what he's trying to do is predict them is create a model that will be useful in more than one field, more than one particular domain. So he built a system called We Metal, and this is basically a Twitter app that you can log into, or I, I guess you can still do it. I haven't done it myself, so I don't know if it's still alive. You could go into it, and it would gather up a bunch of data about you from your Twitter stream, and then would estimate tie strength for the people that you normally you connect with and you reply to and so on. Here's the deep, cool thing. The model that they created for Facebook that was we just saw also works for this set of Twitter relationships. That's awesome. So, in particular, this chart should look very familiar, even though it's from a different, uh, different paper. This is basically that same set of predictors that we saw on Facebook. That's the left column right here. So all this stuff is what we saw from the previous paper, with, ex with a couple of quick exceptions. Okay? If we do the same kind of thing and do analyze those same variables in Twitter, for example, days since last communication, days since first communication, so on and so on, right? And there, you have to change a few things because there's no wall in Twitter. You have to use reply or um, uh, reciprocal um, versus, you know, links to each other and so on. Or there's, for example, you see down here, there's no, no number of applications in Twitter. So whatever, right? So what they found, though, is, is Gilbert did basically the same analysis using the analogous measures, the analogous model variables and discovered, hey, it's basically the same, you know, it's a, it's, which is a remarkably great result. The follower difference um, you see here in the middle between educational difference and follower difference, that's a sort of comp compare and contrast between Facebook and Twitter. Um, they just substituted that one for the other one and basically the same, which is great. Okay? One of the ways that we metal works is it takes your set of connected friends, connected people that you tweet with, and basically creates this set of clusters based on tie strength. What they then did is to validate this, is that they went to the individuals, the Twitter users, and said, does this look right to you? What, what do you think? Okay. So basically, giving the data 
They run the model and predict the tie strength between you, the Twitter account owner, and each of the people. Now, if this these were real pictures, these would all be different people. But you know, this is a they can't do that for the paper for privacy reasons. So that's why you get this vaguely Obama-ish looking guy in all these conditions. Anyway, just consider each, that each one of these clusters, like <clears throat> say the inner circle or the outer circle or flock the other one, each one of these is a basically a group of people that have very close ties, that's the inner circle, somewhat topical ties, like in a community, you see a bird's of feather or flock together. So these are basically two different topical groups. And then you have the outer circle, which is the loosely connected weak tie set of people. Now to validate this, they went, like I said, to the Twitter account owner and said, does this kind of match with what you expect? Is this consistent with what you know? Okay, this is great. The answer is that there's pretty good evidence that the ties that were predicted by the model actually generalize to Twitter from the Facebook model. That is, using the same variables, measuring in more or less the same way, then you can predict tie strength in the same way. When you ask the users does this strength model actually reflect what you believe to be true? They kind of say, yeah, that looks good to me. So this is a great, this is a great result because it suggests that actually it's not just, that is, social relationships in a network, online relationships are not just idiosyncratic to a particular application. That in fact, there's evidence to believe that this kind of stuff is true across social media broadly. I, mean, is, I know this is only two, but remember this is based on work from the 60s and it's, uh, I, th I think, a very important step for the social media theory construction and how we start to understand what makes sense and what doesn't and so on. That makes sense. Okay. All right, let's, let's uh, change topics here to another aspect of, of social networks, which is if you've ever been online for more than five minutes, you probably have run across a troll. Now a troll, we'll talk about in a second, but <clears throat> the important thing here is that trolls are actors in a social network. Sometimes they can be really important. Now they're normally people that you don't want to interact with all that much. They're people who are sort of obnoxious and so on, but they're important players in a whole social network. You see them all the time on Twitter. You see them all the time in comment threads on various uh, social platforms, in particular news platforms and so on. This paper by Justin Chang and a bunch of other people is asking the important question, who are those people? What kind of social tie do I have with them? Because if they're trolls, do I have any kind of social relationship with them? That's a good question. So, um, these folks, Justin Cheng, Michael Bernstein, and Christian Danescu, Nikoluscu, um, Mizel, and Yure Aleskovic, um, are mostly, well, they were all at the time of this, they were all at Stanford, okay? Michael Bernstein is the sort of the, the faculty member there. Um, now also in Cornell, and so the, they're between these two institutions. And they asked this great question, who are these people? So in that social network diagram down below, you see that red dot. That red dot represents somebody who is just antisocial. Now, that's a, that's a troll in my thing. So the key idea for this paper is that, gee, you know, trolls are not, you know, sort of uh, Lord of the Ring-like orcs. You know, they're not evil people intrinsically. But in fact, it's a contextual response by almost anybody. And so what's causing this? And so, so that's, that's the nature of this research, was what's causing this? So what they did, well, let's back up and, and talk about what is a troll, right? Uh, the definition is classically a, a person who sows discord on the internet by starting arguments or upsetting people. You know what's going on here. These are people who leave these really obnoxious kinds of comments. Like, you suck, you fail, you should go kill yourself, right? You're useless as a human being. So trolls are people who do that, okay? 
You see these folks a lot in the comment threads on discussion boards. Uh, Reddit is full of trolls. Uh, name your favorite uh, discussion forum. There are also channels like 4chan, which is an accumulation of trolls. I don't recommend you go do it unless you're really curious. But what causes people to do this, uh, aside from just being jerks? Right? I mean, what actually causes people to leave annoying troll-like messages? And the interesting thing I think about this paper is that they started off thinking, well, you know, these guys have mothers too, right? They're not all evil people, so who are these folks? Now, I want to discriminate between a troll and a sock puppet. They're related ideas, <clears throat> but they're not exactly the same. A sock puppet is an online identity that's used purely for deception. So, for example, people make a, a sock puppet is just a person who leaves comments trying to sway opinion within a, say, a review site. So, for example, sock puppets might go into a hotel review site and leave really positive or really negative reviews, but they don't ever identify themselves by their true name. So, not necessarily a troll, but they often do things that are troll-like in, in that they're trying to elicit a particular kind of social response. This is what trolls do. They're trying to piss you off. I don't understand the psychology of it personally, but trolls are they're really angry about something and they're trying to get you to have a response to that. So the big question here is, are you born a troll? Well, are you? And I think that's an interesting question. So the, the, uh, the, up is the, the key finding of this paper is that people, ordinary people, can be influenced to troll others under the right circumstances. What are those circumstances? Well, here's the study they did. This is, I think, a really, really well-designed study. They polled 16 million comments made on CNN.com. So in truth, this is just an analysis of CNN.com, and we, have to, we would have to go and extend it to see how well it works in other communities. But in the U.S., this is a pretty, probably a pretty representative sample. They found that there are two kinds of things that influence people to make troll-like comments. First off is the mood at the time. And the second is exposure to other trolls. Now, pause for a second. You're doing a data analysis project, right? Now, suppose at this point, you're the, the advisor and you say, how, how would we study that? What would you do? The answer to that question that they did is fairly interesting. So what they did is they analyzed these 16 million posts on CNN.com, right? And they found that 20, uh, and they analyzed the unflagged versus the flag posts. And these are flag posts are ones that are labeled by the management or by, by some authority to be troll comments. They're nasty, they're off topic, they're hurtful, they're all of those kinds of things. So they now have all these posts they know that roughly a quarter of them are labeled as troll comments. What's going on? Okay. They discovered an interesting thing, that troll comments are not made uniformly across the day. What? If a troll was intrinsically, uh, I don't know if you can hear that or not, but there are turkeys outside making noise. So if you hear a gobble gobble effect, it's not me, it's the turkeys outdoors. Um, they found that people make, make troll comments at different times throughout the day. If they were really sort of intrinsically trolls, then they would be doing it sort of uniformly. So what their goal was is to build a logistic model, kind of regression model, that predicts, given some inputs, whether or not a person is likely to troll. Fantastic. Now, from prior research, we know that there are three things that, that influence people to leave comments either positive or negative. In particular, a, there are these three factors. So this, they, go, they knew going into the study. They know, for example, that people, when they're in a negative mood, tend to leave more troll comments. 
They know that there's an effective discussion context and there's a contagion effect. That is, if you see lots of other people making posts, again, positively or negatively, then that influences your behavior, you, the person who's potentially going to be a troll. Now, the contagion effect also works positively. If lots of people are leaving happy, positive comments, then your next comment is probably going to be positive as well. But let's try to figure it out. Again, thinking to yourself, how are you going to test this? <clears throat> so here's what they did. And I thought this was rather clever. So they um, used AMT. That's Amazon Mechanical Trick. Now, quick review. Mechanical Turk is a bunch of people that you can hire for a small amount of money to take tests and do particular small tasks online. So this is a global workforce. What you can do is say, for in this case, I'm sure what they did is they limited it to people in the U.S., English speakers in the U.S., and said, um, for five cents, I want you to do this task. The task would be something like you see on the left here in column A. They can basically give you a task like you have five minutes to, to do these questions. And the questions are things like, <clears throat> we see there, first one, unscramble the following letters to form an English word, P-A-P-H-Y. Well, that one's easy. That's happy, H-A-P-P-Y. Yeah. Excuse me. Um, we are seeing uh, your face right now. We're not seeing the slides. I don't know what happened. Oh. Um. Let me exit this real quick and uh, go, go check. Um, I'm screen. Sh I'm going to turn off screen sharing and I'll turn it back on. Okay. Thanks for letting me know. Okay. Do you see the slides now? Yes. Okay. Good. So I can I continue from this point. Good. Thanks. So, um, yeah, and let me know if that happens again, okay? So what they do, they give these tasks like th this one, PHPY, or subtract 3,000 from 5,000 and write your answering words and so on, right? They've got a bunch of these different kinds of tasks. Now, remember, one of the things they're trying to do is to do this manipulation, where they're trying to manipulate your mood. And if you remember back from the Facebook study, Emotional Contagion, what they did there is they selectively included or excluded positive or negative comments in the feed. They didn't generate them. They were just filtering them in or out. Great. You can't do that here. So they set up this qualification test in two different forms. There's the easy one you see here, and there's the hard one. And a hard one is intended to put you into a bad mood. I thought that was relatively clever. And so you get like a 10 letter word and you have to unscramble it. And I did some of them and they're really hard. And if you do five or six problems like that, yeah, you're not in a good mood. Now what they did in their test is they calibrated this. So this is an important thing about setting up studies like this. They ran a bunch of studies like this and then did classical affective responses to see whether or not you felt good or bad before the test versus after the test. So this is the kind of calibration you need to do because they now qualified this test as definitively putting you in a good mood or a bad mood. So this is the easy one you see here, okay? The easy one basically left you un, un, unmodulated, unchanged. If the, you got the hard one, it, trust me, it left you in a bad mood, okay? So that's clever. The second thing you see here on the right-hand side is exposure effects. Remember, I talked about contagion effects. If you see trolls posts by other people, then you tend to troll. So here they're showing you some news of the day, and they have uh, blurred out a few of the more nasty comments here. But the idea was that they could expose you to other trolls that are either positive, neutral, or negative. Okay, So they're man manipulating all these variables at the same time. So what they did in their study is they had 667 participants, again, all through Mechanical Turk. They then looked at the posts using Luke. That's this L-I-W-C, the Linguistic Interpretation Word something or other. Um, it's a tool where, we've seen this before actually, 
where people can run Luke on a post and it will give a sentiment analysis. It will rate it as being positive or negative or neutral, whatever, give you a score. So this is how they studied the kinds of posts that people would do. They had a decent population, 40% female, average age 34, reasonably split there between Democrat, moderate, and Republican. They then asked these people after the test or after the exposure to the posts to then generate their own posts and then vote on these things. Okay. So these tasks, these mechanical turkers, would come in and do the hard or the easy questions then see or not see a particular kind of post, and then write their own post. Okay. Now, I found this chart. This is a remarkable thing. If you look at CNN.com, and you look at the troll posts, just the ones that were flagged, you look at it by time of day, correcting for time zone, because we only have three in the, in the U.S., right? So it's easy to do. Look at this distribution. It tells you that most Troll posts are made late at night. Okay, look just on the left-hand side here. The, the, it peaks around 2 in the morning, 2.30 in the morning, goes down because these people are sleeping, and then you know rises slowly, and then comes back again, up again in the evening. So there's a strong diurnal effect. That is, people tend to put troll posts out in the evening, especially after midnight. Okay, what's going on? You can speculate about all kinds of things, but you know maybe there's some alcohol involved. I don't know. But <clears throat> it's interesting to then look at their study. So this chart is from CNN over a long period. And it's just you know sort of the, their base gold standard. They know this to be true. This is the data from the Amazon Web uh, Mechanical Turk study. Notice how, the, how the, you get, again, the time of day effects. So in column A there, you can see that's the same chart we saw earlier. All the down votes you see in the third row, the negative affect as measured by Luke, the, the, uh, uh, the flag posts, they're basically the same chart. Okay, it looks almost identical to that. These are two different data sets, but they're showing exactly the same pattern. You also see this interesting, well, back up, this age column here, is by hour of the day, right? So late at night, midnight, and so on. Here, when you look at day of the week, you look at the CNN comments that are flagged by trolls, you know, you see a similar pattern, but this is, you know, Sunday versus Monday, and, you know, nobody trolls on Friday, basically, is what it's telling you. So we have a weekly pattern, we have a daily pattern. And the other thing that is, is very surprising is that if you look in the C column, you'll see that uh, trolls tend to post not long after their last post. So what this tells us is that people who post frequently are more likely to be trolls. So you know what that means. People who are always in there, always commenting, those are the people who tend to see more negative kinds of posts and post their own certain negative comments. So we have at least three different kinds of important factors here. And this is basically an analysis showing the influence of being in a context where negative mood is what you see in the posts. So here, in, in column A here, you see the difference between flagged and unflagged comments, right? So the flagged ones, those are the troll posts. The, the, the red reddish ones are evil comments. That's more likely to happen in column A when you're making a post and the prior discussion was also flagged in, an, in say, an unrelated topic. That's a striking difference between the blue and the red. That means if you've been reading a, a, a discussion that's got flagged posts in it, guess what? You're more likely to, to do that. You see something, a much less kind of effect in column B, where you've particip you, the, the troll, have participated in a sub-discussion, in a discussion with a prior post. So if you're in this sort of thing tangentially, your likelihood of being a making a troll post is small. Okay. Column C is the effect of context. That is, if you are in a discussion that began with a flag post, then you're more likely to have a flag post of your, your own later on. And then, of course, the last one is, is probably the biggest one. If you're in a sub-discussion, that is, you've now focused down on a particular topic, 
okay? So something you care about, that's the only reason you're there, is you really care about it. And if that begins with a post by a troll, then the probability that you'll put a troll post there, that is reply usually, in equally harsh terms, is really high. I mean, look at this. This is a probability, uh, if you, this is in this discussion that's unflagged, it's oh, slightly over half, the probability that you will reply with a flaggable post, that is a troll post, is way up there. So, what this tells us is a couple of things. First, <laughs> the thing that surprised me the most about this paper, about this result, is that people who are in unhappy mood can be convinced without too much provocation to do a post that's a troll post. What this also means, this analysis about the time between posts, tells us that if, if you take longer between seeing something and posting and posting again, that reduces the rate of your being a troll. And of course, these contextual things really do matter. Context matters in the sense that sometimes you recognize an issue as a hot button issue and it's important context for you. It's also, context is also important if you see troll flags in your reading, right? You're reading through this, this commentary and you see something and you realize, oh man, everybody else hates this. I'm going to hate on it too. So this is an important thing. And I like this one sentence from the, from the paper, which is, when online discussions break down, it's not just the sociopath. It's not just the crazy people. We are also at fault. Many trolls are just people like us who are having a bad day. Understanding that we're responsible for both being inspiring and depressing means that we have the key to online productive online discussions. Okay. This is a, one of these papers that really struck me when I read it because it tells me that I could be a troll too. I hate to think that about myself. I hate to think that about you, but it's just barely possible. Okay, so how are we doing here? I think that's the last slide. Perfect. Over